Hello and thanks for joining me for Switzer Investing. I'm Peter Switzer. On tonight's show, Perpetual Fund Manager James Holt identifies value stocks that have upside and gives us quite a lot as well. Paul Rickard answers the questions, are our big miners and banks still a buy? Propertyology Simon Presley names the really hot regions where property investors should be heading. And he says, don't think you have to buy in your home city or town. He treats properties like stocks. And then the portfolio manager of my Switzer high yield fund, Ying Yi and Cheng, does a short lecture on how she invests to get rates of return better than term deposits while investing in top quality government and corporate bonds. That's the show. So let's kick off with the value stock hunt with James Holt from the Petrol. Well, everyone's telling us it's a time for value investing and James Holt from Perpetual is an expert on value investing. So I thought we, A, get a good understanding of what value investing is and secondly, see what stocks he thinks really look like they're in the, the right spot right now. James, thanks for joining us. Pleasure, Peter. Good to see you. Yeah, same here, mate. Now, uh, why don't you tell people what you do at Perpetual before we start you know, tapping into your brain? Yeah, no, it's uh, basically we uh, we effectively are, we describe ourselves as quality and value. So essentially we look for, we screen the universe for companies that are, that are low quality, screen them out. High quality to us means companies with recurring earnings that don't have too much debt, uh, that have a good business model in a good industry. Um, and once we select that universe of quality companies, we then pick the best value out of those quality set of companies. That's how we, that's how, but that's what value means for us effectively is the, the right sort of quality universe and then pick the best value out of it. Okay, so what, for people who don't understand value, give us your, your best definition. Essentially, I mean, that is for anyone who likes to buy a you know, straw hat in winter or, uh, or you know, get a, get a bargain of any kind. You know, I'm usually fine you can buy uh, all companies at some point during this cycle are on sale. Um, and effectively, that's what we're trying to do. So sometimes you've got to be patient. Um, March of, of last year certainly provided the opportunity to buy a lot of companies at extremely discounted prices. We try and avoid, you know, some companies can look optically cheap. They might have a very low PE and, uh, you know, that people say, oh, that looks very cheap. We should rush into that. But it might be cheap for a reason. It might be in the data industry. Um, the balance sheet might be in poor shape. They might have lots of, lots of debt and it's sometimes easy for those companies to sort of look very cheap. But for us, we want to buy a reasonably priced, you know, the, the, the time when they happen to be on sale. But it's got to be a quality company to begin with uh, okay. before we purchase it. For, for those people who still aren't quite sure, and, and, and I must admit, uh, I've talked to other people in your industry and, and they'll say that, you know, that they look for companies where the intrinsic value of the company might be, you know, $10, but the, the, the market only says it's worth 4 and so yep. that's clearly a value company, isn't it? And so, um, but give us an example of a, a classic company that's a value company and compare it to a classic growth company. Yeah, I mean, uh, probably a classic one at the moment would be something, just something that everyone's familiar with would be a company like a Crown or an event hospitality, uh, where, for example, last year, uh, those two companies traded for literally below the net tangible asset uh, backing. In fact, Crown still does, Event is, is recovering as well. But at one point there, I think Event was about a billion dollars, a bit over a billion dollars, but the assets are worth $2 billion. Hmm. And that's exactly what you're saying, Peter, that you can effectively get the company for 50 cents in the dollar. And if you can buy a video portfolio with those, you'd be very, very happy indeed. Uh, so that's, that's what we're looking for. Yeah, and a, a, a classic growth company would be like Afterpay. Oh, exactly right. Exactly right. So <clears throat> it'll be a company where uh, it's uh, it's priced for uh, blue sky futures, <laughs> and it could well have a blue sky future. Uh, who knows? But the problem always is that too much gets invested in the price uh, too early, uh, and it's a risk then of coming back down to earth again. If you think about also all the great success stories, even in America, you think about the apples of the world. Uh, maybe think about a Microsoft and those sort of businesses. Microsoft's still around. It's an incredible company. will be around for a long time, probably. But there was a period in 2000 where the price of Microsoft fell about 75% over the mm. next nine years before it recovered. didn't mean it was a bad company. It simply had too much growth priced into it in 2000. And, that, and all that air came out 
from 2000 to 2009 before it bottomed and then recovered again. And that's that's from our perspective, the risk with, with growth sometimes is that they could be good companies, but they might be priced, they might be worth a dollar, they're priced at 10, you know. Yep, they've got exactly to, right. Gravity, gravity's going to get them, yeah. Okay, so um, <coughs> give us an, an, a, a couple of companies right now. You've, you've already mentioned Crown as an example, but what are some other companies and explain why you think they're undervalued? Yeah, I'd, I'd say, look, for us, value at the moment breaks up into sort of, you know, four broad areas, I guess. Number one, uh, the sort of opening up trade or normalisation trade. So these mm. companies value because for the past 12 months they've been suppressed. Uh, people thought they might go out of business potentially. People didn't know when the customers were going to come back. So that's certainly crown. That's certainly event. Also Qantas. Mm. Um, you know, so travel stocks, hoteliers, all these sort of companies that got hard assets. They might have a great brand behind them. Um, but of course, uh, they started to recover, you know, at the end of last year as the signs of a vaccine were emerging. Um, but they're still not back to their natural full level of valuation. Um, <clears throat> another area for us is insurance. Insurance does well. Everyone's jumped on the banks, but if you notice, the insurers are still left behind, mm. you know, mm. Suncorps and the IAGs and so forth. And yet, when interest rates go up, uh, it's actually positive for the insurers. There's a linear relationship between higher rates um, and, and insurance stocks. So good opportunity to jump on a few of those that uh, that are, are still trading at way below where they were before before COVID hit. Um, AUB, we put in a similar boat as well. So the brokerage where, again, people tend to take out more, more, you know, those businesses tend to do well after a major event like COVID takes place. So um, they're in a good spot. And also uh, industrial uh, material stocks, you know, think about your builders, um, you know, the borals of the world, uh, the blue scope steels, uh, Incitec Pivot, which is in fertilizers as well as explosives, uh, Fletcher Building, all these sort of stocks are still very much, um, you know, on the recovery path, but they're nowhere near where they were before a COVID, COVID hit. Yeah, and, and so, last, yeah, sorry, and, sorry. And, the, and the last one? Uh, I was just going to say, last one is, is metals as well. So, uh, again, we as we go into this recovery, uh, demand for, you know, iron ore is already high. You know, it's a, it's a great story, I think. But again, we think about how high iron ore is. But a lot of other metals are still further back. Um, there's still more upside, we think. And, and also the stocks that, that mine those metals. So you think about your, your sort of nickel and copper and those sort of things, uh, you know, Western areas, Oz, Oz Minerals, um, Aluka, uh, they're, they're the sort of stocks there. We think have got good upside potential uh, as uh, and all their demand, obviously, driven by China as well. Mm. So, so in many ways, all those stocks, look like that they're going to do well over time as the old um, business normal conditions start to come back. That's the thinking behind it. Absolutely, yes. I, and I'd, I'd sort of add, I'd say two things. We are, we've been in kind of a war environment. You know, we haven't, we haven't had a classic war, but the economy has behaved and governments have behaved as though a war has been on. We haven't sent soldiers overseas. We've put people in their homes. Yep. Government stepped in with tremendous amount of fiscal stimulus. Here, obviously, it's, it's, it's worked everywhere. It's worked here in Australia. But think, you know, the stimulus, I think, was about 150 bill or, or, or slightly above that. That's about 7 8% of GDP. Think about America. They've, a, they've, they've done a $2 trillion last year, $3 trillion earlier this year. They've got a giant <laughs> infrastructure program coming as well. So huge amount of money gushing around the world. Um, so that's going to spark. And after a war, you have inflation and you have uh, people want to get out and spend. So there's a high degree of confidence, but also with that stimulus and the recovery, almost always after a warlike situation, you get inflation as well. So I'd say a lot of those trades, if you think about them, <clears throat> the opening up normalisation, clearly the consumers are going to come out. They're going to go to the cinema again. They're going to go uh, gaming, they're going to jump on flights, all those sort of consumer stocks benefit. But the metals and things like that not only offer cyclical exposure to this upside you're talking about, but also some inflation protection as well, because we don't know. Uh, markets price for a little bit of transitory inflation, but maybe there's more inflation to come down the track. That's certainly something we can be thinking about. Yeah, it's something that Janet Yellen talked about last night, and I think she got her butt kicked as a consequence of it too, <laughs> because she, she quickly backed away from it. And the market would be very happy that she backed away from it. Uh, James, one last thing before you go, if people don't want to pick out individual stocks, what fund of yours actually you know, plays the value game? Well, all of these, all of these uh, sort of positions are held by the Perpetual Equity Investment Company, which is under ticker PIC, trades on the ASX, it's a closed-end fund. 
so uh, it's a listed vehicle that people can buy um, anytime on the exchange or through their broker. Great stuff. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Well, joining me now is Paul Rickard from the Switzer Report. And I want to talk to Paul about, about two things, particularly in a week when the tech stocks got a little bit rocked by talk from uh, Janet Yellen, the US Treasury Secretary, that interest rates might rise soon. She fortunately backed away from that. But tech stocks went down, and usually when tech stocks go down, banks and even miners can go up. Paul, I'm interested in your view on whether there's more room to run for bank shares and our miners. Look, Peter, I think if you'd asked me two, three months ago, I would have said no, because yeah. I think I wrote about six months ago, could the banks get back to $25? Could CBA get back to $80? Yeah. Now we've got, I think you and yeah. I disputed that one. I, go no, on. well, no, I think we, well, we said they could, right? Yeah. But yeah. the time frame was a lot longer. Yeah, uh, that's and right. uh, this is when the banks were trading about $17, $18, and mm. um, CBA was in the low 70s. So yeah. we were pretty, pretty, pretty bullish. Yeah. Uh, so where they are today is really um, got a lot further than we were talking about at the yeah. time. So look, I mean, this week we've had uh, some bank results there. I mean, overall you have to say they're, they're pretty good. I mean, the, the right back of the COVID stuff, that's not unexpected. Mm. We always felt there were too many provisions last year. Even yeah. at the time, the provisions looked over the top. Over the top, Because yeah. their forecasts looked, you know, I don't think any of us would call out that unemployment couldn't have gone up to 10%, but it was a pretty gutsy, big, yeah. big rise. Uh, and, so and the governments were asking a lot of the banks at the governments time. Governments were asking a lot of the banks, and I think so to see the reversal of those of those huge write downs, in other words, give them a big positive, is is uh, is, is not unexpected. Mm. But there are some good things. I mean, net interest margin is 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 improved, and that's probably they've done a lot of work on yeah. the deposit stuff. And NIM, by the way, is like the jaws you talk about: revenue versus cost. Yep. So that's that's actually improved. Um, secondly, the, the uh, there is some growth. You have home markets going yeah. strong, which we'd expect. You know, we're in a buoyant home 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 market. Uh, and then thirdly, they've actually done a pretty good job on costs. And I guess that was always been the challenge for the banks. I mean, they've been so badly beaten up. They've taken all these compliance costs. You know, people aren't going to branches anymore to do banking, no. right? They've got so many digital competitors. They finally seem to be at least starting to talk to, to, to work on the costs. The good results with ANZ. Westpac's made big promises. You know, yeah. we've seen <clears> big, big promises before. But they, they need to work on their costs. They need to actually get their compliance costs down, take on the regulators a little bit and say this is out of control. So yeah. on those sort of days, you're now getting sort of yields, even at these current prices of up near 5%, 4.85%, fully yeah. franked. Yeah, it still looks pretty attractive for yeah. investors. So although I think the best days of banks are behind us, yeah. uh, and you know, all the arguments about price book ratios will come back in, you know, where's the negativity? You know, they've all got capital's really strong, ANZ ratio 12.2. Mm. We're going to see capital returns from Commonwealth Bank later in the year. It's very hard to see what the negative outlook is, apart from the fact they are struggling to grow revenue. Mm. And that's, that's probably the major negative. But Paul, story. do you think some of the banks will actually start thinking about buying some businesses that have revenue? Like, why not buy a buy now, pay later company if they're affordable? Well, I think they're going to have to, Peter, because, mm. I mean, growth is, as a lender, uh, which is all they've become, you know, mm. basically commercial mortgages, home mortgages and, and, and deposits. Mm. That's what they are now. They're back to their very much traditional Banking. roots. Institutional banks, the institutional components have been, you know, taken back, reduced, that risk has been taken out. They've got out of wealth management. So uh, there's not much left, Peter. So growth is still the big challenge for our banks. Mm. And uh, I guess that in you know, that come partly by acquisition. I think every bank board around the country and CEO is saying, well, I know what I had to do to survive. I've survived. I can keep on cutting costs. That's interesting, but not exciting. Mm. How do I grow? And yeah. that's still the number one challenge. And that's why I think as investors, despite the fantastic dividends now on offer, you know, you just got to worry they are probably getting- mm. Close to their top. Close to their top, because mm. people will say, well, there is no growth. So yeah. uh, I think they can go a little bit higher, Peter, but I, it's probably not the time to be re-weighting massively to banks. The mm. best time to put money into banks is now behind us. Yeah. So therefore, going forward, Banks will be primarily bought for income, but what about miners? People are buying miners for income now, but historically, they didn't buy miners for income. Yeah, I and mean, look, this is instructive, Peter. I mean, look, let me just throw up this chart. I did this earlier in the week, yeah. and it's uh, it's based on the uh, the current prices of, of BHP, Fortescue, and uh, uh, 
and Rio at the time. Yeah. And look at Fortescue, based on a current price of $21.43. The major brokers are forecasting a dividend of this year of $3.52. Staggering. That translates to a 15.6% yield. And that's, Peter, is, is before franking. These are going to be fully frank, right? Oh, yeah. Even mm. next year, FY22, we see a drop in the dividend. But mm. That's because they don't, no one believes this $180 can stay there forever in the iron mm. ore price. Yeah. But they're still thinking times are going to be pretty good, mm. a dividend of $2.51. 51 cents and a yield of 11.1%. Mm. Now, they're the three majors. Now, as, you, as we know, you cannot rely on uh, miners for dividends, Peter. No. So don't buy and them brokers dividends. forecasts are not infallible. And brokers forecasts, it's all based on the commodity price. You ask a broker 12 months ago, who was expecting the iron ore price to get to $180? And the brokers were forecasting about $60, the same as in Josh mm. Frydenberg's mm. last, last budget. budget. Yeah. So don't rely on brokers forecasts. But... They're there, and at the moment, it's if you're an iron ore miner, it's all you're living in. Yeah. Uh, what's the phrase, Peter? But it's like it's living in la la land. Living in la la land because uh, you know China's buying, and uh, the biggest iron ore producer in the world, Vale from Brazil, uh, hasn't been able to get production of back. Has a coronavirus problem in Brazil, plus his own company has issues. But poor, I guess and it won't last. Eventually, no, that's right. That production will come back into the market. And the Chinese mm. iron ore miners and others, iron ore mills and others, have all been investing in Africa. Yeah. And there are new resources coming on in Africa at some stage that will, um, yeah. you know, that, that will impact the uh, iron ore price. And Might I, be a few years off, but this yeah. is not going to last forever. And I don't want to be an alarmist, but you know, there are people out there talking that one day China could engage in a real war, and I tell you what, iron ore prices would probably fall. That, um, well, yeah, that's, if you, you know, if you do believe in the whole Taiwan scenario, mm. you know, the people talking about, it, I don't, but. Uh, you know, I think Me neither. You know, heads will, mm. you know, will get back as, as usually happens. We pull back from these catastrophes, but you know if that happened. If let's say there was an outbreak tomorrow, yeah. on these mining prices would would just be okay. absolutely trashed. Right? Let me put you on the spot then. I, if you're someone who doesn't hold Fortescue right now, and they, they look at that and say, "Hell, fifteen point six percent potential return plus franking seventeen point six or so." Um, how long would they have to hold that to actually pick that return up, Paul? Well, I mean, it, it totally depends on, on, on the iron ore price. Yeah, but what, what's the when, date of the dividend payment? Yeah, I look at the next dividend for 40 After scale, August, um, I would have thought. Well, I, after August, uh, I'd have to check for... Oh, you just caught me out. I've, I've yeah, that's no, okay. But look, I mean, you get, that's based on two dividends, but a lot could happen to the price. I mean, my... I look, I don't hold Fortescue. skill. I prefer BHP simply because it's more diversified. It's got revenue streams in copper. It's the, Australia's biggest copper producer. It's also going through a great bull market mm. uh, and um, also uh, oil as well and and uh, so I, I think it's a bit more diversified so that's the way I would prefer to play it but uh, look Fortescue uh, you know you, you, you're there living in it's for the thrill seekers yeah. but uh, it can also provide a very good income and uh, so I guess you probably at least factor in the first year and saying okay. it's been really so cl secure. to clarify that when you got uh, FY21 dividend yeah so that, is that the dividend that will come out in August and then the, the next one that comes for, after February? For, for BHP and Rio, it's certainly this, it's, it's, it, it's include, it, there's one more dividend payment to come for yeah. this financial year. Yeah. Sorry, for, 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 for BHP, it's for this financial year that ends on the 30th of June. Yeah. For Rio, it's the financial year that ends on the 31st well, of December. So, so Rio's got two payments to come. Yeah. BHP's got one. I'm just not 100% sure whether Ford excuse a 30 June or 31 December balance date. Okay, so right. it's whatever their financial year is, but BHP is one more dividend to come. The first one's been paid. Rio, it's, uh, it's two more to come. Very interesting stuff. That's Paul Rickard of the Switzer Report. Now recently, Simon Presley from Propertyology actually talked about how you can become a in property investment winner. So I want to run through some of the, the key pieces of advice he would share with someone who wants to win at property investing. Simon, thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure, Peter. Okay, let's kick off with the, the first thing you, you made a point about. You said, don't follow the herd. And you looked at Sydney and Melbourne in 2016. What's the story there? 
So, Pet, if we went back this time five years ago and did a straw poll amongst Australian property investors as to which locations they thought would be best performed in Australia over the next five years, I'd suggest that most people would have said Sydney, Melbourne, followed by Brisbane, because property investors are really creatures of habit. And for some strange reason, we think that big is better. But actually, they've been very underwhelming performers. The best performed capital city over the last five years was Hobart with 50%. Our next best performed capital city was Canberra with 30%. Um, Sydney, Adelaide and Brisbane only had about 15% growth over the last five years. And that's for houses. Apartments have barely moved at all over that last five year period of time. Without doubt, the best performed property markets in Australia, there's about 30 individual regional locations that have been Australia's um, star performers over the last five years. Yeah, so you're basically saying people are preoccupied with capital cities, but there are actually either smaller cities or towns around the country which have been much better at perform performing. Now, look at your notes here. There's about 180 locations, I think, which you, you like to compare them to stocks. Tell us what your thinking there is. Well, yeah, I mean, of course, um, I, I think one of the common causes of why property investors don't achieve anywhere near their full potential is they there's their own bias that comes into the locations they select. Most property investors buy an investment property in their own city. That's like a share investor saying, I work in the financial services sector, so therefore I could only buy shares in Commonwealth Bank, for example. So I think we always encourage our investors to be borderless. Where you live is your personal decision, but you really should consider our eight capital cities and about 100, um, 180 individual regional locations as the equivalent of companies on the stock exchange. Mm. Remove your bias and understand local economic drivers and the things that influence both supply and demand of real estate in each of these locations. If you do that, you're considering 100% of your options as opposed to just your hometown or a small handful of capital cities. Okay, now looking at, once again, your notes, you had Byron, the Macedon area, Mornington Peninsula, Torquay, Noosa, Shoalhaven, and you make the point that the, the two of the best cities out there were Burnie and Launceston. So if we take this as to be the case, I guess being someone who operates in the, the financial institution space, uh, we often say, well, past performance is no guarantee of future performance. Would you expect those reasons to continue to be good deliverers or do you have to look around again? And if you do, what do you look for? Your first point first, I totally agree with you. Um, past performance has nothing to do with future performance. But what we, what we should do in making important decisions, all financial decisions, is to learn from past performance, understand why things perform well or why things perform poorly, and then bring that back to the here and now and reevaluate current conditions. Are the conditions for each of these markets likely to produce good growth going forward or, or not? So what we're not saying is buy in a, in, in a Byron or, or Warrigal or Mornington Peninsula have done really, really well over the last five years. Don't buy there because they've done well before. Understand why they did well and then look for locations that have those ingredients today. Many of these really strong regional locations, and actually the second question, Peter, yes, they still have really, really strong fundamentals. But if you're trying to get into those markets today, you're probably halfway through a growth cycle. Um, as a property investor, I'm unashamedly greedy. I want to try to get as close to 100% growth that a cycle produces. So mm. we, we focus our attention more on markets that haven't been doing much for a long period of time. Yeah. And like, for example, do you look at a market that's been good, it's gone off the boil for a variety of reasons, but those reasons now are becoming less, less uh, impactful and therefore th those reasons could come again? And if so, can you name, one, uh, name some that fit that sort of category? Uh, Hobart's the first one that comes to mind and, you know, easily been Australia's best performed capital city over the last five years. In fact, its rate of growth is double six out of, uh, of the other seven capital cities over the last five years. Yeah. Now, I, I must admit that about 12 months ago, I thought Hobart must be really close to the end of its cycle. It has had a really strong run, but it's got a really strong spring in its step now. And, and as we're having this discussion, it's running at about 20% annual growth rate. Gee. And we look at the fundamentals of Hobart today on the, both the supply side and the demand side of things. I, I can't forecast when that will stop. 
Yeah. It will stop at some stage because no market can forever uh, can, can run well forever. Yeah. But things start and stop for a reason, mm. and those reasons, though inf influencing forces today, are very very positive. Yeah, it's interesting. About three or four years ago, I was in Hobart on a Friday night, uh, having dinner with a, a business group, and it was completely packed out. And a, a guy who was the husband of a former New South Wales um, government minister who had, as a family, they'd gone down to Hobart maybe eight, nine years ago. He was actually saying to me, he, he watched me on TV, he came up and introduced himself, and he said, you know, we moved down here for a quiet life. He said, look at this place. It was Friday night, the whole place was packed. He said, we're going to Launceston. It's interesting, that was about three or four years ago, and you made the point that Launceston is now on the way up. But what I brought up is that often I've found with my real estate investment is if you can't get in the suburb that's really hot that you want to get into, you then think of the ripple effect, what's the next suburb on? And so when I look at, at Byron, say two years ago when it was pretty hot, I thought, well, Kingscliff seems like a really good area. It's like 20 minutes from the Gold Coast Airport. Is that the kind of thinking that you use to work out what are the next areas when places like Byron have been you know, going through the roof? No, uh, there is there is merit in the ripple effect. Um, you know, certainly uh, that that factors into our overall decision making as to which parts of Australia we'll invest in. We still need to make sure that the the new location that we're investing in, it because it ultimately has really strong fundamentals, not just because of a a hope that there's a ripple effect that sort of drags along. Launceston's a good example. I um, mean, Propertyology was investing in Hobart between 2014 and 16 when the market was flat. It's gone nuts since. We've started investing in Launceston in about 2015, but not just because of the ripple effect. The, the local economic conditions and the supply side of things in Launceston are spectacular. Mm. And I'd argue that right here and now today, it's the strongest market in all of Australia. Mm. Extraordinary. Okay, so if, if someone watching this wanted, wanted a great leg up from you, and you have to be right as well, Simon, where would you recommend that they start thinking about for investing? Uh, in property well step number one is to be is to consider yourself as an investor completely borderless it doesn't matter where you live you're not buying a property to live in as an investor so disregard all that disregard whether you would live in the individual town or city because your emotions and your feelings are unique to you not to everywhere else Focus on uh, understand the local economic conditions. That will always have the biggest influence on property prices. But there are so many markets throughout Australia right now, Peter, that have a really exciting outlook. It's, it's impossible to sort of um, list all of them, but no. maybe we give, I don't know, how many do you want? Two three. in each state? Three. Like Just give us three in total, and your three best calls. Three best calls. I would say... Launceston is the best, but good luck trying to get in, into it. Um, we've actually given up in the last couple of weeks. It's near impossible. So Bendigo, um, which is really the, 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 the capital of central Victoria, very diverse economy. Uh, you'll need about four fifty dollars to $500,000 to get into that market there for a standard detached house. Uh, in Queensland, I'll nominate, uh, geez, you've got to pick one, I'll nominate Townsville. Uh, you'll need a budget of sort of four hundred to four hundred and fifty thousand dollars in Townsville. Lots to like about the outlook for Townsville's economy. Um, and in New South Wales, we'll nominate um, we'll nominate Albury in New South Wales, mm. uh, the border town, um, a great manufacturing hub. Um, it's the it's the golden triangle between Sydney, Melbourne, and Canberra. Yeah, yeah. and when, every time you drive through it. It gets bigger, and the and the and the shops there actually indicate how much the population must be going there. You know, Bunnings is huge, Harris Farm markets. It's just extraordinary how big Albury is becoming. Mate, great to talk to you, and uh, let's hope your your tips are absolutely on the money. Let's check in in three years' time and see how we went. <laughs> Cheers. Good on you, Peter. Have a good day. Hi, I'm Yingyi An Cheng, Portfolio Management Director at Coolabar Capital, and today I'm going to be talking about fixed income. In a low yielding world, how does one generate high returns? In fixed income, it's typically no different to any other asset class in the sense that if you want more returns, 
people, investors or managers can typically chase more risk. In fixed income, this could take the form of chasing on more interest rate duration risk, otherwise known as fixed rate risk. This would involve investing in longer dead fixed rate bonds, which compensates you for losses on interest rate risk. Example of that would be investing in a 10 year bond as opposed to a five year bond, for example. It could also involve punting around by interest rate futures. Another way to drive more return would be to chase more credit risk, so the risk of default or loss. Examples would include high yield bonds or loans, so those that are rated double B, B or triple C, or even unrated securities. Or you could chase more illiquidity risk, so illiquid loans, illiquid corporate bonds, and illiquid ABS, so asset-backed securities, and illiquid residential mortgage-backed securities. Those securities that you can't trade in and out of very easily. In that respect, it's very straightforward because you know that when you chase more risk, you should get compensated with a higher rate of return. What is harder is extracting alpha to generate higher returns. How do you find alpha in fixed income? Well, you do that by finding capital gains. How do you find capital gains? You do so in identifying mispriced bonds. What is a mispriced bond? Well, it's a bond that is paying too much interest or spread after you adjust for its risk factors. And examples could include the credit rating, the term to maturity, the industry of the issuer, the liquidity of the bond, where it sits in the capital structure. And if that interest rate is higher than the fair value, then one can look to buy that bond. And as that interest rate or yield drops towards fair value, that lends itself to price appreciation because there is an inverse relationship between the bond price and the yield. And then you're able to sell that bond for a capital gain. So it's no different to you finding capital gains in equities, but you can also find capital gains in fixed income. Something to also be aware of in fixed income portfolios is diversification. Here, I really want to emphasize the paradox of fixed income diversification. Many so-called active fixed income portfolios have anywhere between 200 to 1,000 securities. However, most investors would not know 25 to 50% of the names in those portfolios. Diversification is really a vehicle for taking much more credit risk or the risk of default or loss which all converge in a crisis or a recession like we saw last year. During a recession, all these businesses face the same risks. Therefore, we see default correlations spike, liquidity risks also spike. And rather than reducing risk, this form of fixed income diversification actually increases both credit risk and liquidity risk. And as I mentioned, this explains the extreme illiquidity and poor performance amongst fixed income portfolios in 2020. At Coolabar, we prefer to focus on systematically important businesses that have little or zero inherent credit risk. And instead, we focus on investing in securities that are issued by entities that have either implicit or explicit government guarantees and that are either oligopolies or monopolies. And at Coolabar, we're focused on capital gains rather than taking on more risk to drive return. In order to find these capital gains and to find these mispricings, you need a very large team, which is why we have built the largest team in Australian investment grade fixed income. So we have 26 full-time executives at Coolabar across four offices, two in Sydney, one in Melbourne, one in London, and within the investment team, we have five portfolio managers and 13 analysts, 10 quants, four PhDs, and two university medalists. And the reason we have such a large team, as I mentioned, is we're trying to look for these mispricings, these sources of alpha and capital gains. Meanwhile, we also happen to be the most active trader of Aussie fixed income globally. So we're typically trading 70 to 100 times a day and on average at least $150 million a day. If you look at our last 12-month returns to the end of March, you'll notice that in the top row here is the gross return. Meanwhile, if you look at our capital gain, 
it's quite substantial. And in fact, capital gains as a proportion of our gross returns is around 70%. In this strategy, it's actually 126.5%. Meanwhile, you can see that we generate consistent alpha or capital gains across all bond sales since Jan 2020. And I know the writing is quite small, but you will notice that over more than 9,500 trade sales in total worth around $14 billion, we have made money 98.5% of the time. That is our win ratio. How often are we finding capital gains? Actually, that's 92.4% of the time. And that's on average AA minus credit rating. So we're not reaching down the credit risk spectrum. We're not taking extra default risk. Our median holding period is only 52 days. So we're trading very actively. How active are we? Since the start of 2020, we've sold close to $15 billion of bonds and bought almost $19 billion of bonds. So in total, we've traded over $34 billion of bonds. You can see our trading activity. The aqua bars are the sells and the red bars are our buys. We were particularly active pre-COVID, during COVID and also post-COVID. You'll notice that in January 2020, when credit spreads were very tight, people thought that equities was expensive, for example, we were actually de-risking our portfolios. That was our largest sell month in history. We sold $1.14 billion of bonds. In Feb and March, when the market was throwing the baby out with the bathwater, they were selling risky assets and even safe assets and just switching into cash. We were actually contrarian. But what were we actually buying? We were buying, as I mentioned, securities with little or zero inherent credit risk. So bonds issued by the major banks, for example. So in March, when a lot of our peers had issues with liquidity, we actually bought $900 million and sold $100 million. We had no issues with liquidity. In April, you can see that we started taking profit. And in April, a lot of our peers still had issues with liquidity. And we were started buying bonds again. In fact, we were buying state government bonds in August, and that was in anticipation of RBA QE. As you can see here, this is all of our trade sales. Every single black dot is a trade sale since the start of 2012. So since Coolabar's inception. And what you can see is that we've demonstrated persistent alpha and a 98% win ratio over more than 19,800 trade sales with a face value of more than 22.17 billion. You will notice that the average credit rating has been high throughout. It's been A plus. Our median holding period is only 63 days. And what you'll notice is that the coupon or the yield on each of these securities is actually quite low over the last nine and a half years. And that's because we aren't trying to drive returns through interest rate duration risk or credit risk or illiquidity risk. Instead, we're focused on capital gains which by the way, are quite substantial. So the capital gains serve to augment the interest that we earn. And so if you look at our IRR on these bond sales, it's actually close to 12%. Rounding off, if you look at the Switzer Higher Yield Fund, the target return is cash plus one and a half percent. The target rating is also very high. It's in the A band. You have daily liquidity. And in terms of the target holding, it's 30 to 60 active alpha generating positions. And the top holdings are listed here. Names that you would recognize, but as mentioned, securities that have very little intrinsic credit risk because they are issued by oligopolies uh, or monopolies, for example, the banks and governments themselves. So New South Wales, Queensland. If you look at the interest rate duration, there is zero interest rate duration. In terms of the investable assets, uh, it can invest in cash, investment grade bonds, and hybrid securities. Looking at the asset allocation, you will notice that more than 24% of the portfolio is in government bonds, and the rest are in bank securities. On that note, 
thank you for your time today. And I look forward to engaging with you in the future. And that's the show for this week. Thanks for joining us. Now, if you're not a subscriber, please become a subscriber. We want you all watching the show as much as possible. So if you click on the, the subscribe and the little bell right beside it, we'll alert you when the latest show is out, which I think is a really good deal. Thanks for joining us. See you next week.